Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Chatham House. My name is Elizabeth Palmer, and I'm a reporter for CBS News, uh, and I cover Iran. I've covered uh, Iran for our network for the past decade. Um, this session, as you know, is uh, the Iran nuclear deal, uh, false hope, question mark, one of the great questions of modern history and maybe one of the great historical pivots. And now I'd like to uh, introduce our very distinguished panel. Uh, on my right, Sir Richard Dalton, who is an associate fellow in the Middle East and North African program here at Chatham House and also uh, the former British ambassador to Iran. On my immediate left, uh, uh, Fawaz Jerzis. Did I get it right? Perfect. <laughs> um, Professor of Middle Eastern Politics and International Relations at the London School of Economics and somebody you've probably heard often on the BBC or, or read, a frequent commentator on Middle Eastern politics and in particular Iran. And finally on my far left, Sir Tom Phillips, who is also an associate fellow here at Chatham House in the Middle Eastern and North African program and also a former British ambassador, but in Sir Tom's case, to Israel and Saudi Arabia. Not at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> the format for this session uh, will be opening remarks by each speaker for between five and seven minutes, uh, a deadline that I'm going to enforce. Um, and after that, we'll throw, uh, the question, the, th throw the session open to questions from the floor. With that, let's begin. Sir Richard. Thank you. I suggest there's two ways of looking at this question. One, looking at the nuclear issue alone, and the other, posing the wider question of the nuclear issue in the context of relations between Iran, its Arab neighbors, and the international community. To take the first one, it's really, is negotiating with Iran under the 24 November Geneva Agreement the right way of dealing with the issues raised by Iran's nuclear program, and is the hope attached to those negotiations real? Well, my answer to that question is yes, it is the best way, and the hope is real. In brief, with the implementation agreement that came into effect on the 20th of January, Iran's 20% enrichment program has been halted and the stock downgraded. Its 5% low enriched uranium stock has been frozen. Its centrifuge development and installation capacity has been frozen. The Arak heavy water moderated reactor is now much more open for scrutiny and no further work is going to be done on it. And IAEA access has already been enhanced. So this lives up to the billing which President Obama and United States partners in these negotiations have given it. Iran has delivered, and so has the European Union and the United States in the concomitant lifting of sanctions. So I wouldn't say that mutual trust has been established, far from it. But the first steps have shown both sides that the underlying idea of getting something for something, win-win, uh, can be real. As for the comprehensive agreement, negotiations on which are going to be launched next month, agreement is difficult, but it's possible. First, it's not going to eliminate Iran's enrichment capability, as many, including Israel, have wanted. The aim is going to be to ensure that if a decision were ever taken by Iran to break out, to develop a weapons capability, then their basic capacity from which they would start would be low enough, and the time before succeeding in that effort would be long enough to assure both detection and a response to prevent it. Now, by that test, I believe this negotiation will succeed. It will do so by determining what Iran's practical needs for nuclear enrichment will be based on a program for further power and research type reactors. And of course, all kind of other issues will have to be addressed too, like the potential military dimensions of past activities, the future of their research and development, adoption of the gold standard for veri verification and monitoring, namely the additional protocol to their safeguards agreement, and so on and so forth, not to mention the length of any transition period 
and a programme for progressive lift of sanctions. So what's the politics like for actually achieving that agenda? Well, I believe it is in Iran's interests and that they recognise that it is in their interests to abide by their declared policy, which is not to have nuclear weapons. Of course, they perceive, as we all do, the potency of both physical military deterrence uh, and intelligence coverage of Iran. Iran is unlikely to cheat, in my view, because it would be caught. I think a fundamental plank of the politics, too, in Iran is going to be finding a way, and this is going to be the job of the six countries negotiating with Iran, of diverting Iranian nuclear nationalism, which is very potent, away from enrichment, its current totem, towards power generation. And of course, throughout the process, and thinking about the politics still, uh, the leverage over Iran's decision-making offered by the current level of sanctions uh, is going to remain substantial. On the minus side, of course, Rouhani's position is fragile. There is consensus on the need for serious negotiation, but not yet any consensus in Iran on the shape of their nuclear program long term or on concessions that can safely be made. Extremist forces in Iran may take action to undermine what's going on. Ayatollah Khamenei himself supports the diplomacy but still has to show that he accepts that extricating Iran from its economic decline and loss of sovereignty uh, requires accommodation in practice with the United States and its partners and with Iran's neighbors. But I have to say on the minus side, uh, a great threat, perhaps the greatest threat to our hopes comes from the combination of Israeli lobbying, the power of money in United States politics, APAC and Republican <coughs> hatred of President Obama. It's going to be hard to get the necessary staged relief from US bilateral sanctions. How do I sum it up? 60-40 in favor of success. Well, what about my second question? Using the leverage obtained over Iran through the nuclear issue for other purposes. Some have said that we should link sanctions to human rights. Others have said that it was a betrayal of the Arabs, particularly the Sunni Arabs, to engage Iran while they are engaged so unacceptably in Lebanon and above all in Syria. The question is, is the Syrian tragedy and the Syrian government's responsibility for it so heinous that solving the nuclear problem should have been shelved and sanctions maintained to exert pressure on Iran in respect of Syria? I think the answer to the Syrian question and the human rights question, unfortunately, is no. In brief, Iran is fulfilling its obligations under the nuclear agreements it has entered into, and if an attempt was made now to alter the legislative basis for sanctions against Iran, the nuclear issue, by adding other justifications, two things would certainly happen. The sanctions regime would crumble and the nuclear negotiations would collapse too. The road to improving Iran's relations with its neighbors, improving Iran's behavior internationally in general, and indeed to the increased prospect for its internal reform lies through the nuclear question and strengthening the hand of those who've advocated and opening up to the outside world uh, thereby. Antagonistic voices in Iran will certainly drown out moderate ones if Iran's neighbors and the West are unable to make progress with its current government. Just under the wire. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank yes, you. Professor Garius. Uh, my assignment today is to say a few words about uh, the American position, the logic and the rationale behind the Obama administration's uh, decision to uh, proceed with the deal with Iran, and say a few words also about the nature of this particular deal and what it means in uh, geostrategic terms uh, for the Middle East itself, even though I'm going to say a few words about uh, the Saudi and Israeli position. I think uh, Barack Obama uh, simply summarized the American position when he met with a group of senators, both Democratic and Republicans, uh, during the talks with Iran. He said, well, look, 
if you are opposed to the nuclear deal with Iran, that means uh, we're gonna go to war against Iran. And the alternative to signing a nuclear deal with Iran would have meant basically war between the United States uh, and Iran. And I think that statement by Barack Obama um, in the White House uh, captures the essence of the American position. Uh, we all know uh, that Barack Obama does not have the will and the desire to get engaged in another major military venture in the Middle East, uh, neither in Libya nor in Syria, let alone uh, in Iran. Uh, one of the major lessons that we have learned about the last uh, six years is that Barack Obama has been basically systematically disengaging uh, from the Middle East. The Middle East is no longer, the administration no longer prioritize the Middle East as uh, part of its uh, top priorities. America um, is shifting its economic and political and foreign policy priorities away from the Middle East to other areas in the world, particularly uh, the uh, Pacific uh, region. In fact, the uh, Barack Obama uh, policy uh, establishment uh, believes that the American, United States of America in the last 10 years or so has overextended itself in the Middle East far and beyond what America's vital interests uh, require, quote unquote, that the United States uh, uh, has overextended itself and thus the United States must begin the process of disengagement, gradual uh, disengagement and investing um, in areas where America's future lie, quote unquote. They believe that somehow the Pacific region has emerged as a pivotal theater where America's national interests, both economic and political, lie in the next 10 or 15 years. And I think the people around Barack Obama, I, I've written a book on this, uh, uh, it's called Obama and the Middle East, the End of America's Moment, in which I focus a great deal on the perceptions and the views of the American foreign policy elite. They believe that you cannot dance around Iran, um, whether in the Gulf or in the Mashraq whether in Bahrain or whether it's in Iraq, whether in Syria or whether in Lebanon. Iran is here to stay. And thus, the administration knows very well that it has to come to terms with Iran, given the fact that the administration is not prepared to go to war against um, uh, Iran. As you all know, in 2012, Barack Obama uh, was unwittingly, uh, 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 he, he, he basically, bound his own uh, hands, fettered his own hands as a result of what the ambassador called, I mean, domestic pressure uh, by uh, particular constituencies, in particular by Israel, when he said during the, as you know, the, the, the last few months of the presidential elections that if Iran does make a decision to build a nuclear uh, uh, weapon, that the United States would go to war uh, against uh, Iran. So in this particular sense, the, the, the consensus within the administration is that Iran was proceeding. It was a matter of a year, a year and a half, that Iran was bound to uh, reach a tipping point in which the administration uh, red line would be called into, uh, I mean, putting the, that particular red line in operational terms. And thus, uh, the uh, Iranian nuclear portfolio, I would argue, is one of the most uh, uh, important portfolios for the administration, much more important than Syria, much more important even than the Palestinian-Israeli uh, conflict because the administration knows, given the pressure on the administration, there is no way around dealing with the question of Iran, in particular if Iran uh, reaches that particular uh, tipping point. I, I will also um, want to say a few words, even though the ambassador flashed out the, the, the logic behind the Iranian uh, position. We know, we, we think we know that the new leadership in Iran also recognizes how the sanctions, one of the most stringent sanctions regimes in world history, has really bled Iranian society and economy. It also threatened the legitimacy and the authority of the Iranian, the Islamic Republic itself. It's not just about economic and social pain, it's about what the sanctions regime mean for the stability of the regime. And thus, a decision was made to engage the United States to lift the sanctions, a strategic priority for the administration. But here is the punching point, my thesis, uh, today is that even though, and I could be wrong, of course, because as you know, we have very limited information, um, in particular what has taken place behind closed doors. 
between the Americans and the Iranians. I think what we're talking about here is not positive rapprochement, as the consensus has it in the Middle East, if you read commentary in the Middle East, if you talk to Saudi leaders or Israeli leaders, they believe somehow a secret deal was reached between Iran and the United States. And this secret deal, this rapprochement, this grand bargain would have major geostrategic implications for the Middle East. I think what we're witnessing here is what I call negative rapprochement. And the reason why it's negative rather than positive rapprochement, because you have institutional and domestic uh, constraints that basically fetter the hands of both the American and the American leadership. You know, in the United States, again, both in the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, there are vast interests opposed to any kind of a major breakthrough, major rapprochement with the United States. And in Iran, of course, uh, President Rouhani and uh, Foreign Minister Zarif faces institutional and bureaucratic challenges to any kind of an open-ended engagement with the Americans. So what we are witnessing really is limited, a kind of limited, the beginning of a relationship that basically punctures hole in the institutionalized anonymity between the United States and Iran. And a final point on this, because my time is coming to an end. I think this particular, even though it's limited, even though it's not an open-ended uh, rapprochement, has major implications, major implications in Iraq. The United States and Iran seem to have converged interests in Iraq, even to a lesser extent in Syria, in Lebanon, in terms of deactivating the minefields, in particular the sectarian minefields that threaten the existence of some states in the region. Thank you very much. Um, I'll just mention there are a few sprinkling of seats here in the front. If anybody standing at the back wants to creep forward, there's probably 10 or so free. Finally, let's move to our last speaker, Sir Tom Phillips. Uh, thank you very much. I am going to focus on uh, Saudi Arabia and Israel, uh, both of which have intriguingly similar concerns about Iran's role in the region, both about the nuclear program and about Iran's more general behavior in the region. And in fact, when I arrived in Riyadh in, in 2010, I was struck by how similar the sense of threat and encirclement uh, was to what one used to pick up in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. In Israel's case, and with apologies, of course, for the oversimplification, the country's narrative is based on a deep sense that they live in a hostile region, and they see Iran as a particular threat in its support for groups such as Hezbollah, uh, in Iran's extremist anti-Zionist rhetoric, and of course in the prospect that such a country might one day develop the existential threat of a nuclear weapon. I, I, I know that at least some Israeli analysts reckon that Iran is actually quite unlikely to use a nuclear weapon against Israel for a host of reasons, including what would come back at them uh, if they did. But they certainly worry that extremist groups in the region will feel empowered under some sort of nuclear umbrella. Perhaps the model is the Kashmiri groups in the countdown to 2003 with the Pakistani umbrella. Um, they worry about the prospect of proliferation in the region. If Iran gets the bomb, who else will? And of course, ultimately, they, they think if you get into a totally unproliferated region, who, who will stay when you can go and be a lawyer in Los Angeles? Uh, it's much simpler. So even the existence of nuclear weapons in the region is seen as a threat to the Zionist project, as it were. So the Israeli uh, reaction to the interim nuclear deal has been predictably, but I would also say a little bit simplistically negative. I mean, if at the end of the day uh, the, the deal means that sanctions have been working and there is a prospect of Iran dropping its military nuclear weapons without anyone having to attack Iran, surely that would be a good thing. And maybe Israel could have nuanced its response uh, a little bit more carefully, however skeptical they might have wanted to sound at the same time. And there is, I think, a whole complex issue of the linkage between the Iran issue and what else is happening in the region. In particular, Israeli doubts about the Obama, Obama administration's handling of Egypt and Syria, and their wish that Secretary Kerry was spending more time on such issues rather than pushing for a, a framework agreement between Israel and the Palestinians. I don't believe there's ever been some kind of simplistic US-Israel understanding that if you take out the Iranian nuclear program, we'll accept a Palestinian state. But certainly in the minds of Israelis, of many Israelis, there's some kind of linkage between their willingness to, as they would see it, lower their security guard in their immediate backyard and the confidence they do or don't feel that the Americans will be there for them when it comes to any ex major uh, security threat. So as one of the things, as Richard said, it's going to be fascinating to watch in the months ahead is what do the Israelis do, especially in Washington, uh, about uh, the prospect of a deal with Iran. From the Saudi perspective, I think there's uh, perhaps even deeper history going back to the fault lines between the Persian and the Arab worlds and, of course, the Sunni-Shia 
divide, which is such a great game feature of the current region. And in brief, I think even without the nuclear issue, there was a sense that the Shia crescent stretching from Iran via, via Maliki's Iraq and Assad Syria to Hezbollah in Lebanon was expanding to places such as Bahrain, Yemen, down into Africa, and of course, in Saudi Arabia's own oil-rich and fairly Shia population-heavy eastern province. So both Israel and Saudi Arabia see the Iran nuclear program not simply as a problem in itself, but as symptomatic of the rogue Iranian role in the region as a whole, and even as part of some loosely defined bid for regional hegemony. And even if the Saudi public line in response to the interim deal was more sophisticated and less resolutely negative than the Israeli one, they too worry that it represents yet another Western, particularly American, blink, although, of course, from a Saudi perspective, the first Obama blink was when he let uh, Netanyahu off the hook on the settlements issue back in 2009. Um, hard on the heels of Obama failing uh, what they took as his commitment to punish Assad military for his use of chemical weapons. And I was in Riyadh last week and was really struck by how deep the Syrian nerve is. And, and a sort of, just as a footnote, the sort of model, I think, would be what Spain meant in Europe uh, in the 1930s, that sort of resonance in, in Saudi society. I think Saudi fears uh, can broadly be defined as, first of all, a concern that a West desperate, given especially the long shadow of Iraq, to avoid another military entang entanglement in the Middle East, will settle for an unsatisfactory deal with Iran and may even be fooled by an Iran that will find ways to continue a covert nuclear military program. Secondly, that even if Rouhani is genuine in wanting a deal, he'll be somehow outwitted, overruled by the hardliners in Tehran. Thirdly, that the lack of Western resolve will also mean that we will turn too much of a blind eye to Iranian troublemaking in the region more generally, and they certainly continue to see instances of that very hostile agenda out there, uh, the discovery of a large arms cache in Bahrain in December. And conversely, and fourthly, in a way that the final deal with Iran will allow Iran too, much, too prominent a place in regional security deliberations. And maybe just below the surface, there's a bit of a worry that a West less dependent on Saudi oil than in the past will find Iran with its democratic habit and all of that, or sort of democratic habit, uh, more of a natural partner than they are. There's a lot of talk about whether Saudis will now look for elsewhere for strategic partners, but as I see it, they know that they haven't really got that many options. They can't, China and Russia wouldn't really replace them. France has won some points there, but hasn't got the military volume to come to their rescue in the event of certain uh, worst case scenarios. So they do know in all of this that at the end of the day, they need um, the Americans. Uh, they watch the stuff about the pivot, but I don't think they're over concerned as yet about the reality of a, a real pivot. But we shall see uh, further Saudi self-help efforts to develop their own capabilities and to build up GCC defense coordination, even if they know that the latter in particular will remain work in progress for some considerable time, given the traditional fault lines in the Gulf. Two final points. As I see it, the Saudis are very much in reactive mode at the moment. I think it would be useful if they were to focus on defining and setting out their own positive vision of the region they want to see and what, it, what a stable balance could look like. In the same way that with the Arab Peace Initiative, they set out a very positive vision of what the region could look like in the event of an Israeli-Palestinian uh, and Syrian and Lebanon deal. And, and finally, however much Saudi Arabia and Israel may share concerns about Iran, I think the Israelis are over-optimistic that this might mean some kind of breakthrough when it comes to the bilateral relationship and secu security coordination between the two countries. I think the key Saudi <laughs> message remains that the doorway to any such relationship remains resolution of the Palestinian issue, including critically uh, the issue of East Jerusalem. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I'm going to open the, the floor up to questions now. Um, we have a couple of roving microphones, do we not? Yes? So uh, wait for the microphone to get to you before you ask your question. And um, stand, if you would, and give your name and affiliation. And then uh, uh, do ask the question. And if I might ask you to keep it brief, that would be terrific. Um, thank you very much to all of our speakers for such lucid and interesting remarks. Um, yes, sir. Don't you think one of the problems of negotiating an agreement is the double standard of Western and U.S. policy towards nuclear proliferation? Pakistan, who is supposedly a staunch ally of the United States, is the home, has nuclear capacity, has been shown to disseminate this knowledge to certain nations, is a supporter of the Taliban. Uh, and if I were Iranian, 
I'd say, what's the difference? Why are they getting the support from the United States? Not considered a danger, but we, we're not allowed to have one. And I won't even go and speak about Israel. We don't speak about the Israeli pot nuclear potential. Nobody says it. Everybody accepts it as being right, everybody in the Western world. Do you want to address the question to one of our speakers in particular? Or? Well, I think all three of them are quite okay. qualified. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Sir Tom, would you like to take a run at it first? Oh, golly. Um, well, I'll give a very personal view. Not, I, I'm no longer in the government, so I'm free. And I certainly think that the Western attitude on nuclear weapons generally is shot through with double standards, that we missed a real opportunity at the end of the Cold War to change the dynamic altogether, though you know, I know the UK will feel it did better than anyone else in reducing the number of platforms and all that sort of stuff. But I, you know, I can see what it looks like from a Muslim perspective in particular. You know, if, you, if you want to see it on the Security Council, how come all the P5 have got a bomb, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, the narrative goes very deep. And I know what the, uh, uh, the Israel bomb means in the region and how much stress the Saudis in particular put on the Middle East free of weapons of mass destruction uh, initiative. However, you know, as that ghastly diplomatic phrase goes, we are where we are, and we're trying to deal with the situation now. And Iran developing a bomb now certainly ain't going to help. Um, so if there is a way of dealing with that issue in a peaceful way, I think it's something one has to do what you can to support as a goal. We should also uh, uh, recall that Iran has never said it wants the bomb. In fact, on the contrary, it says it doesn't. So it can't very well say, why can they have one and we can't, because they, rhetorically, they're a bit trapped. They, they say they don't want one, so it shouldn't matter. <laughs> Professor Jesus? Yes, next question. <laughs> um, the lady in the gray jacket. Nasreen, is that you? Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Um, Nazanin Ansari, Kehan London and Chatham House member. This is a question uh, directed to Sir Richard and his brilliant policy mind. Um, in consideration of the fact that in the past... Um, month alone, there have been over 40 uh, public executions in Iran, and there has been in an increase of arrests on journalists and political uh, activists. Uh, what would you say, what kind of a policy would you recommend um, that would have a benefit for those in Iran who are not for any attack or war, but who want to have a better standard of living, um, normal, ordinary Iranians? Thank you. Well, the first thing is to <clears throat> get the nuclear negotiations right and to lift sanctions. Uh, only that way will President Rouhani be able to be strong enough domestically to tackle the issues he raised during his election campaign. Now, there's a deeper question, namely, uh, Rouhani hasn't spent his life working to undermine the Islamic Republic. Uh, he believes in the art of the possible, and he is a, a loyal servant of the Islamic Republic. So we're only going to see improvements at the edges, even if his regime is strengthened as a result of developments over the next uh, year, or more likely two years. So that leaves open the question, is there anything that countries like the United Kingdom can do to either strengthen his hand in his own domestic battles or put pressure on Iran over and above what we are already doing. And what we are already doing is participating in various United Nations initiatives, dialogues, specialized rapporteurs, <coughs> uh, endorsement of hostile resolutions to Iran's human rights record. Over and above that, I hope that the European Union will resume its human rights dialogue with Iran which is better than nothing, but we have to recall that during the time when that was an active dialogue, it achieved almost nothing. Uh, as for further pressures on Iran uh, over its human rights record, uh, that's speculation too far in the future, and I'm, I'm not going to get there, other than with the general warning that I think there is very little we can do, as there is also very little we can do or were able to do towards some of the worst human rights abuses elsewhere, whether you're talking about Chechnya or human rights issues that arise in the Arabian Peninsula. I'll have one from this side of the room. Uh, yes, sir. 
thank, thank you very much. Uh, you and Grant, a um, former intelligence analyst and Chatham House member. M my question is really prompted by, I think it was this morning's um, Financial Times, or maybe yesterday, where there were comments about um, differing approaches between the UAE um, on trade with Iran as a possible opening a door, and other GCC perhaps not so keen. Um, where do the non-Saudi um, GCC states stand, and uh, particularly maybe as an indicator of their rather curious position about arms contracts like the uh, fighter plane contract in the UAE, which seems to have been frozen, and um, it seems somewhat strange that how, the, how they are playing this. What, what, they, what are their views, both, again, in relation to Iran and also perhaps in relation to Saudi Arabia? Thank you. Would you who would like to take a run at that first? Well, I mean, uh, let, me, let me contextualize the question and, uh, by saying we didn't, of course, we didn't, have, we didn't have the time to really flesh out the complexity of the nuclear deal and what it means in the region itself. But the, the bigger point that I really would like to make is that the biggest threat to regional stability today, if you look at the, the, the greater Middle East, is the geostrategic fierce struggle between Saudi Arabia and Iran, truly which has sectarian connotations. Uh, and it's playing out in Iraq, uh, in Syria, in Lebanon, in Bahrain, in Yemen. This is really a life and death threat that basically has tremendous implications for the survival of some states. Lebanon is in the eye of the storm. Syria is coming apart. Iraq is facing a major. And I think at the heart, I mean, if we focus on sectarianism, we miss the big picture. The, miss, the big picture is the struggle between Saudi Arabia and Iran. It's a geostrategic struggle. You know, I've just come back from, like you, from the Gulf, and I, I was in Oman. And I was really shocked by how nuanced the Omani perspective on Iran's role in the Gulf. The Omanis were highly critical of Saudi Arabia. They believed that Saudi Arabia was all over the map. Saudi Arabia was basically out of control. Saudi Arabia was acting in a very naive, immature way. Iran is our neighbor. Iran is here to stay. We need to find mechanisms to deal with Iran. If you talk to the United Arab Emirates as well, the Iranians praise the United Arab Emirates. They're real. They say they're realistic. They have an open-minded uh, uh, framework about the relationship. And the United Arab Emirates, even though it has some major, as you know, uh, points of conflict with Iran, it has been much more accommodating to Iran than Saudi Arabia. So there are even Qatar on this particular point. Qatar openly says we, we would like to have a good, solid neighboring relationship with uh, Iran. And this explains the major differences and tensions within the Gulf Cooperation Council about basically a more unity uh, framework. So yes, there are major differences, and it has to do with different, differing readings of Iran's role I mean, the Omanis say, look, Iran is our neighbor. We have never seen any kind of aggressive role on the part of the Iranians. We have a good relationship. The United Arab Emirates says so. I think the big question really, I mean, here and probably is, why Saudi Arabia is so bent and determined? I mean, the, the, it, it, it is, it's truly, truly fascinating to see, as you said, I mean, even in Syria itself, I mean, it is, I mean, people think of Bashar al-Assad. Uh, the Saudis are not concerned about Bashar al-Assad. It's the bigger, uh, uh, I mean, prize. That's Iran. They want to deliver a blow to Iran in uh, 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 Syria. Uh, the same way in Lebanon. I mean, the, the Lebanon also is a, in the eye of the storm because of the Iranian-Saudi uh, uh, conflict, uh, Yemen, Bahrain, and, and other places. So yes, there are major differences. Uh, a more nuanced reading in some of the Gulf capitals um, and I think the big question at this particular stage, and that's why to come back, final point about the Americans, my hope is that the new American-Iranian relationship would bring a bit of, you might say, complexity um, on the part of the United States trying to convince the Saudis that it's about time to engage the Iranians and find a mechanism uh, for moderation and cooperation. Otherwise, the entire region uh, uh, will basically uh, be damaged as a result. Would you like to add something? Yes. I mean, I, I agree with all of that. Um, I think I said in my speech that GCC coordination will remain work in progress, uh, defense cooperation. 
And, and I think what's striking at the moment in the Gulf, or one of the things that's striking, is a sort of variable geometry. You've got you know, one grouping of countries working together on Egypt, uh, whether or not there's a grouping working together or some sort of loose coordination or failed coordination on Syria, but it's different groupings, uh, and it's, it's more confused, I think, than it's been uh, for some time. And there are a range of different views towards uh, Iran, even actually to a degree within Saudi uh, Arabia. Um, I think that, uh, you know, on the back of the deal, there were some in, in Riyadh who were saying, well, if we don't trust the deal Uncle Sam's going to do with the devil, maybe we have to do our own. Uh, and, you know, there was all that toing and froing last year about whether there was some sort of invitation of some kind to come to the Hajj <coughs> for Rahani, which was never quite clear what, what happened uh, in my mind. But I think that, for the moment, that founders on lack of trust. Uh, and, you know, politics in that part of the world, as you know, is, is very personality to personality, and it is about trust between people at the top. And somehow that's got to be addressed somewhere in, in all of this. But that's also why I, I said in my remarks, I think it would be great if the Saudis could set out their vision thing. You know, well, what is your positive vision of what the reg a stable, secure region with a balance of everyone's interests could look like with people working together uh, shared security mechanisms. I think if people focused on that, I think it would be helpful. Richard, would you like to add anything? Yes. No. Right. Yes, sir. Uh, I'll come to you next. Hi. My name is Bijan Farhoudi. I'm a freelance journalist in London. I have a question for the panel. Some people say had the uh, P5 plus one waited a few months longer, uh, the sanctions regime would have really crumbled their economy uh, to the point that even the regime's longevity might have been in danger. And by agreeing to talk to Iran, actually, some, as I said, some people say that the uh, U.S. and its uh, partners in Europe gave the uh, Iranian government a new lease on life, Iranian regime, I should say. I would like to get your view. Should the P5 plus one have waited a few months longer, or are they really helping Iran, Iranian regime to stay in power? Sir Richard. Uh, a few months wouldn't have made any difference at all. Uh, a couple of years probably wouldn't have made much difference. Uh, and that is because there is still scope for the Iranian government to draw in its horns and preserve its shrinking public budget for the essentials, namely keeping going the cadres on whom they depend for the survival of the regime. Yes, the economy is in a very serious situation. Uh, but it wouldn't have been so much more serious after another six months as to have enabled the deal to be struck differently, let alone to have led to the collapse of the Iranian system of government. And just a, a tiny footnote on, on uh, <clears throat> truly the sanctions have decimated the middle class and the Iranian economy. I mean, let's put politics aside and say sanctions have led the middle class. Uh, I mean, you know, the statistics are overwhelming uh, in terms of unemployment between 20, 30, 40 percent, in particular among the youth. Um, the the uh, real has, has declined by 40 percent just in the last two years. Uh, poverty, I mean, just go to Iran. Any one of us who, I mean, th this is a, a supposed giant state. It's a poor country. I mean, you feel it, you see it. it it's what has happened to Tehran. It, it's a big village. Um, and in particular, the middle class um, um, just decimated uh, as a result of the sanctions. The question on the table is, uh, will the sanctions regime has led to regime change, as some of the people, the conservative establishment in the United States and the West would like. I, one of the lessons we have learned about sanctions in history and world history is that sanctions don't really produce their desired effects. Uh, whether you're talking about, even in the case of Saddam Hussein, he survived from 1990 up to 2003. It took, you know, uh, 500,000 American uh, uh, troops to dislodge Saddam Hussein from power. So the question of regime change, I mean, uh, if you want to invest in, in, in the sanctioned regimes, you're going to talk about decimation, social and economic decimations of society itself in Iran as opposed to the regime itself. Yes, sir, you. Uh, uh, may I just say, uh, in going forward, one of the things I'm interested to know is how we perceive the supreme leader's apparent shift change of heart. Uh, he's a black box, but uh, we can read the signs. So if you want to address that on the way by as we carry out questions, I'd be very interested. <coughs> Go ahead. The microphone's on its way to you now. Uh, hello. Sam Nassif, journalist. 
I want to ask uh, about this Geneva too and uh, this Iranian uh, thing. They were invited and uh, then they were not invited. And uh, the way they reacted, uh, isn't, isn't that significant, uh, Ambassador uh, Dalton, that they didn't react in the usual way, that they didn't get upset about it. And already they have made so many overtures towards Saudi Arabia that they want to meet with Saudi Arabia. And what they are getting is just negative rather than positive uh, sort of policies. How should the Western world deal with uh, this kind of uh, attitude? And who is behind it? Is it the Saudis or the neocons in the United States and their allies in the region? Well, who's behind what? Sorry, can I get you to qualify? Who's behind this, this uh, negative attitude from Saudi Arabia refusing to meet with the, the Iranian uh -huh. leadership? Okay, all right. Refusing to get the Iranians on board in Geneva to... Who is behind it? Is it just uh, Saudi princes or is it uh, some people behind it? Well, let's ask our panel. Well, I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I look, uh, Iran has reacted very negatively. President Rouhani and Zarif in the last 24 hours made it very clear uh, that, quote, unquote, nothing will happen in Geneva. Uh, this is more of a show, uh, comedy. It was, and it, it pointed message on the part of the Iranian leadership to the slap uh, at the face. Uh, regardless of what we think of Iran, regardless of how we view Iran, Iran, uh, Iran's role has sustained the Assad regime in the last three years. The most powerful and the most important player uh, siding with the Assad regime. Uh, if we are genuine, truly, put politics aside, if we are genuine about reaching a settlement in Geneva, Iran's participation is crucial because Iran is the driver behind the survival of the Assad regime. Yes, it's part of the problem, but it could be part of the solutions. And even John Kerry made it very clear, an open invitation uh, to uh, uh, Iran. But in a way, how the Americans also reacted to Ban Ki-moon's invitation tells you a great deal about the institutional and the domestic and the bureaucratic constraint that the United States is under. And look, the United States has not been forthcoming with the Saudis, whether it's on the question of Syria, whether on the question of Iran. Uh, Saudi Arabia is very angry, extremely angry with the Americans. Uh, it's lashing out all over the place, whether it's by refusing to uh, take on the seat at the Security Council or by talking about different security umbrella, broadening its security, uh, what have you. My take on it is that, as you said and I agree, there are multiple power centers in Saudi Arabia today. You have the intelligence services, you have the foreign ministry, the king is not in a very good position. You have multiple princes speaking with multiple uh, voices. And truly, what's fascinating, and again, it's not just about politics. How, the, if, you, if you compare the Iranian leadership and the Saudi leadership, you have one message coming out of Tehran. Zarif goes to the United Arab Emirates and Oman by saying, we are willing to embrace the Saudis. Regardless, we want to build bridges to the Saudis. One consistent, one systemic, he goes to Beirut, the same message. You don't hear it from the Saudis. And I, my take on it, a final point, I, I know we don't have the time. Uh, you really cannot understand the Saudis' position without understanding security in the Gulf as a whole. The American invasion of Iraq, the occupation of Iraq, the canceling of Iran, of Iraq as a deterrent uh, uh, to Iran. And the Saudis perceive their view now a huge vacuum in the Gulf. Uh, Iraq has been um, offered to Iran on a silver platter. Saudi Arabia feels obliged to counterbalance Iran, not only in the heart of the Gulf, uh, but also in the Arab al-Mashriq, whether it's in Syria or Lebanon. They, they believe, they feel that Iran is penetrating the heart of the uh, Sunni Arab world. And Saudi Arabia feels that's why they're very disappointed with the Americans, because the Americans are not doing their side of the bargain. But the reality is, and this is what about the positive vision, what is the vision of Saudi Arabia? What kind of, what kind of, I mean, a, a roadmap? What kind of a strategic posture uh, it has? Um, and supporting the rebels in Syria uh, would not, I mean, deliver uh, 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 Syria to, to Saudi Arabia. In fact, what we are witnessing in Syria, again, we're not talking about Syria. Syria might come to haunt not only the entire Mashraq, 
but might come to haunt the Gulf state as well, in the same way, in a similar way to what Afghanistan did, um, you know, after, the, uh, after 1989. Yes. Uh, uh, again, I, I very much agree. I think on the business of who's inviting whom and who's saying no to whom, I mean, don't assume that everything you're seeing in the press is, is the end of the story. I mean, I'm not in the loop uh, anymore, but I, I, I'm pretty sure that more is going on uh, than you know, we're necessarily seeing, and I wouldn't put blame simplistically on, on, on one side, uh, as it were. Uh, I think, I mean, I tried to get into my speech, uh, you know, we talked about the Saudis, and again, I agree with this, their sense of encirclement uh, and threat, I mean, way before the Arab Spring, and certainly before where we are now, uh, and, you know, they would point, if they'd heard you well, that they see a positive, aggressive, Iranian agenda against them. You, you can argue analytically whether they got that all right, but they would say, look at the arms ship shipments to the Al Houthis, look to the arms cache in Bahrain, et cetera, et cetera. Look above all to what's happening in Iraq, where they see Maliki as a sort of client uh, state. And you know, when they look at Syria, you know, I mean, I, some of us were at a speech uh, the other evening uh, where Prince Taikal at Turkey Al Faisal was speaking. You know, Syria under foreign occupation. You know, the Iranians and you know, some of the uh, the uh, Saudi analysts we met last week were talking, you know, did a very good analysis of you know, how many uh, militia groups they are, Shia militia groups, we're all worried about the Sunni ones, but you know, they think there are even more uh, uh, Shias on the ground doing sort of unmentionable things. And they see us as denying the Syrian people the right of self-defense. And until you get into the, their mindset of how they're seeing that, so that's why I emphasized, I think, this, the, the emotional tone it's setting in Saudi society is the Spanish Civil War. It's something like that. It's very, very deep, very profound, a lot of family links, a lot of religious uh, links. And it's, it's not just cynical power play. It's very deep. Thank you. Uh, yes, you, and then you, sir. We've got 10 minutes uh, left, so if we can keep the questions quick. and uh, answers brief, that would be great. Paul Beckett, former student of King's College uh, War Studies Department. We talk a lot about you know, why Israel, Saudi Arabia, the US acts the way it does, but we don't seem to really talk about why Iran is acting like it does. I mean, perhaps the people in Iran might talk about the history of what they perceive to be aggression, both regionally and from the West, that's making them, drives this urge to uh, get a nuclear weapon. Is there more that can be done to look at what Iran's security fears might be? Are, they, are any of them legitimate? and try and deal with those as a way of emboldening or empowering the moderates against the hardliners. Yes. I'll wrap that up, if I may, with your suggestion that we talk about Ayatollah Khamenei a little. I think he's negotiating, he or rather willing to see his government negotiating uh, for four or five quite clear objectives. He wants to overcome the effects of sanctions. He wants to promote regime security and authority. He wants to blunt what he believes to be the Zionist and US assault on Iran. Uh, he wants to reflect Iran's prestige and leadership of the Islamic world. Uh, and uh, I would have thought, if he got down into the detail, he would say things like uh, obtaining a long-term Iranian nuclear industry that can justify its sunk costs and diversify electric power generation. I think he would also agree that Iran should, by negotiating away some of its worst differences with other nations, uh, promote the respect agenda. In other words, Iran to be given the weight in the world in regional councils, uh, which its uh, history and its present weight uh, deserves. So I think that's what he's after. But we don't know how far he's prepared to go in allowing his government to make concessions. Uh, he has posited the theory of heroic flexibility, which is drawn from uh, Islamic history in the Iranian version, uh, under which it is legitimate to give away uh, deeply uh, entrenched positions of strength if, in return, uh, you gain matters that are of equal or greater importance. Uh, and I suggested that it was the odds on the, the odds of success in the nuclear negotiations are, are favorable precisely because I think a deal that meets the bottom lines of both countries, including Ayatollah Khamenei's, uh, is achievable. Yes, sir. I'll come to you next. <laughs> uh, thank you. 
My, my name is Scott Proudfoot from the Canadian High Commission. Uh, Sir Richard mentioned that nuclear negotiations would establish Iran's actual enrichment needs. Uh, now, one recognizes that the Iranian public has a sort of totemistic attachment to enrichment, the nuclear nationalism described. But apart from that, objectively, given the structure of the Iranian nuclear power program, the fact that Bushehr comes with a power supply, a fuel supply rather, and given the fact that most countries which have extensive power programs don't have enrichment, what are Iran's actual enrichment needs? You can look at that in a number of ways, uh, depending on the amount of political risk you're prepared to accept. And Iran, Iran's historic experience, including being bilked out of its, uh, both of its investment and its uh, potential product to be delivered from Eurodiff, uh, not to mention the long and tortuous history of Boucher, have made it utterly paranoid about relying on overseas trade. So I don't think you can, you can uh, persuade the Iranians that just because other states that have a calmer relationship with the rest of the world rely on international trade, uh, they should too. Uh, I think the actual enrichment needs that one can foresee uh, are <coughs> divided up into about three areas. Uh, the first is uh, generating medical isotopes through the use of Tehran research reactor and its successors. It has to have a successor. It's over 50 years old. They've suggested they need four. That would be reasonable in relation to the, the, the needs of a country the size of Iran. Uh, secondly, uh, there is future fueling of the Arak reactor should it be modified to reduce its potential as a producer of plutonium. All reactors produce plutonium, as you know. But that one is a particular danger and must be attended to. But it could, in future, use domestically produced low-enriched uranium. Uh, the third area would be whether or not it's legitimate for Iran to build up a stock for a reserve load for Boucher against the possibility of supply interruption. That would require way in excess of the low-enriched uranium stock that they already have, which is nothing like enough for even a single load for uh, a reactor of the size of Boucher. And the fourth, I think I mentioned three, but in fact there are four, is what I mentioned in my remarks, namely whether or not there should be a civil reactor program long run and whether uh, they would rely in future on overseas supply as they have for Boucher or whether they would want and be permitted to supplement that with domestic production once they were in good standing. So the negotiation is going to play with those four elements. Somebody who's had their hand up for ages and I haven't recognized it. It's happened Bill to me Patey before. Right Which one? Bill yes. Patey in the front row here. Mr. Patey. Hello, uh, William Patey, a former diplomat. Um, uh, could I ask Richard um, whether uh, what he thinks? I mean, I, I think a comprehensive agreement looks difficult given the uh, mutual distrust uh, and the 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 what shall I call the right wing forces in both countries who who don't want an agreement. But do you think a, this six-month agreement is extendable and we, uh, uh, you know, almost uh, indefinitely? Uh, w w would that be a sort of a plan B uh, if there was a, a failure of the comprehensive uh, negotiations? One could certainly envisage a succession of interim agreements without actually finally uh, resolving all the outstanding questions. Uh, that would become potentially unstable, uh, depending on what it was that was unresolved. So it would be far from ideal. Uh, I think they're right to go for a comprehensive agreement in one jump, because they've already done uh, quite a lot of preparatory work through the 24 November agreement. Uh, but you could envisage a staged implementation of that comprehensive agreement, leaving some particularly difficult issues, uh, for example, the, the, the future scale of the enrichment program uh, for later, if it weren't possible, for example, to define practical needs, as our Canadian colleague suggested, uh, in, in, in the short run. And yes, the six-month period is extendable for a, a further six-month period in accordance with the 24 uh, November agreement, and I believe it could be extended further if it was in the mutual interests of both sides to do so. 
I was rather heartened that you gave a comprehensive deal better odds than Barack Obama did. <laughs> Slightly. <laughs> There's a young man right at the back that I, I think deserves a chance. Thank you very much. Yako Kurashi, research fellow here at Chatham House. Um, I have two short questions about the regional players. One concerns Israel. Um, there's a perception that Netanyahu might have overplayed his hand and potentially mismanaged relations with the US. And I was wondering uh, to what extent the panel sees possibilities for a shift, uh, however slight, in, in the Israeli position. And the second question was concerning Afghanistan. Um, obviously, the security equation is changing with the, uh, with the exit of the, of the troops or, or partial exit of the troops in, in 2014. And uh, there seems to be some scope for shared interest uh, between Iran and the U.S. in Afghanistan. Uh, do you think that will affect the negotiations in any way, or is there some, some room to find more common ground and build more trust? Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that's just going to have to be our last question. Perhaps we can uh, uh, let each member of the panel have some remarks. Uh, Afghanistan, I'll leave and hope that Richard will do, will do that. Um, uh, Israel, uh, Netanyahu, whoever playing his hand, I, I was certainly struck by the you know, unremitting negative nature of the Israeli public line on the deal. I mean, as I said in my speech, I think they could have said, it would be absolutely great if there's a peaceful way to resolve this issue, but we've got a thousand and one doubts, you know, that, which is essentially what the Saudis said. I think that would have been right. Whereas it sounded as if, there's, as if they were saying there's no solution except to bomb these guys, which, you know, is not really a message that's going to go down too well uh, just at the moment. Um, what that will mean, uh, do I see a possibility of an Israeli ship? Well, there's some Israelis out there in the audience, and I haven't been there for a, a year now, so I, I, uh, I'll introduce you to a couple of people afterwards, and, and we can uh, talk about it. I mean, of course, we, we are, in theory, some sort of push is going to come to some sort of shove pretty quickly on the framework agreement or not on the Palestinian issue. I think that's going to send a pretty critical indicator of how Netanyahu is going to think about playing or reacting to or working with the American administration in what's left of the Obama administration. Richard, you want to tackle Afghanistan? Ye yes, definitely. Uh, there is scope, uh, as there was between 2001 and 2003, for the United States and Iran to discuss their respective approaches. Afghanistan's always going to be a neighbor, and there's always going to be a huge traffic of population from Afghanistan into the more developed economy uh, of Iran. So whether or not Afghanistan is stable is, is a vital national interest uh, for Iran. Uh, they will want to see a successor government that is sufficiently broadly based uh, to be able to run Afghanistan successfully. And uh, I hope that uh, a dialogue with the United States will develop on just that point. With that, I will close the session by thanking our distinguished guests, Sir Tom Phillips, Professor Fawa Gerges, and Sir Richard Dalton. And also thanks to all of you for attending. Thank you.